Hi everyone, my name's Emily McInerney. Um, I'm the PNC coordinator as my normal role, but at the moment I'm PNC lead project for our HRIS implementation team. I work at CBUS in Melbourne, um, and I'm actually here to talk to you today because my previous career was, I was a professional basketballer, um, and I represented Australia, and was fortunate to be in the team that won the World Championships in 2006. I'm a World Championship gold medalist and a Commonwealth Games gold medalist, so. You know, I'm going to come over here and join you because Adrian's going to say, I'm just going to come over and join you. So we've actually discussed, we've had, truth be told, we had a discussion in Philadelphia uh, last fall. And we had uh, other panelists, uh, a track athlete, uh, a coach, Pat. Uh, at uh, the Philadelphia 76ers professional basketball. And we talked about this idea of performance. And you know, what are we really asking people to do to be a high performer? How does that make them feel? What kind of stress does that put them on? Is that the right language that we should be using? So how do you define performance as an athlete versus what we're asking employees to do in terms of performance? What are some of the distinctions that you make? Uh, well, performance as an athlete is really clear because A, as a basketballer, we had stats that were kept that we could see whether we were performing um, within the team, how we were performing, whether we were doing our role, but also in comparison to our opponents. But um, as a team, to ensure that we knew that our effort levels were there, we had our own KPIs and our um, one of our assistant coach would keep track of those stats and that's how we would measure our effort performance and how engaged in a game, I suppose you would say, how, what our effort levels were yeah. to uh, achieve the team goal. Yeah. And do you have that scorecard? Were you reviewing that after every game? Or you have, what was the frequency in which you looked at this data? Oh, absolutely, after every game. Um, obviously, if you had a win, the stats would tend to favour you. But if there was a loss, there would be um, really obvious um, markers within the stat sheet or our effort um, stat sheet. So, for example, if if the opposition had um, 20, 21 offensive boards and we had 19 defensive boards, clearly we were not doing our job boxing out. And if that's a strength and something that we said we were going to do as our KPI, we hadn't met our um, our effort level targets either. So some things were glaringly obvious in stats, but some games it was just the look and feel of the game. Sometimes the stats look like you should win, but you don't. And that's sometimes people refer to them as the X, X factor. Sometimes <laughs> it's just something that doesn't go right or goes right on the day. So the geek in me says there's variability in the data. <laughs> right? So it just it's not linear like we were talking about. So embedded within that, I heard individual stats and team stats. Is, is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely right. So within organizations, it again, for me, begs the question, what's the frequency in which we're look, looking at our individual stats? Do we even have individual stats that matter? Like, just show of hands, who uses uh, workplace intelligence by Microsoft? Like on an individual level, like, yeah? So it's actually you know, pretty cool. You, all of you have iPhones or Samsungs, I, I imagine, or you know, Galaxy. And all of those now have, uh, what do you call it, digital scorecards. So you can look at how much screen time you have. My son and I enjoy doing this each evening. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> he, he, can I see your phone? Why? Don't look at, don't open that you know, scorecard. But it's actually, hey, that's a lot of screen time. You're creating self-awareness, and then you can adjust. Is that how you would hope that data is used in, in sports and in a professional environments where you have a heightened level of self-awareness? Um, I suppose that's available to them now. I've, I've been thinking about the story I was going to tell was um, was not highly technical, um, mm -hmm. and you've heard the story, El, but, um, but I thought how that could translate to what's available now with your Fitbits and all these types of things, yep. that there could be a dashboard that a coach could have that could monitor not only the stats and performance in a game, but also how the athletes are feeling and what they're doing away from right. uh, away from the court as well, um, because there are ways to measure um, a lot of... BMI stats and, and things like that now without needing to actively go and seek it. It's just available because technology's got made that available now. So right. I've, I've actually thought that, how a coach could monitor how their team is faring, um, not only just in the games, but outside of, of playtime as well. Absolutely. And who here is using wellness data uh, in their, an organizational setting? Anyone? Like biometric data? Yeah. Just a handful, because then it screams 
the ethics of that and what is the benefit back to the employee. Now, in the States, there's quite a few organizations that are doing this and it's gaining in popularity. It reduces healthcare costs and what employers would pay for insurance and so forth. So there's also arguably a benefit for the individual in that they're incentivized to, to be more healthy. Uh, but those are question marks largely. They're working hypotheses, you know, and through analytics we can understand whether or not that's actually delivering on the value. So in your professional role, which most of us are in, how do you see these individual performance metrics either working or potentially even being a, a detriment, you know, whether it be bio data or other data? In the workplace? Yes. Hmm. You um, want to talk about sports, don't you? Well, I came up here. I, I, the, the truth is, I came here not. I'm not an analytics person, um, but I'm interested. Uh, having attended Philadelphia's um, conference, I'm definitely interested and I'm learning a lot. Um, but that's not my specialty, and that's why I feel. Uh, where's Adrian right now? <laughs> that's the part he was going to bring. I was going to talk about my personal experience of how I use. Well, the data. you know, I, it's important to all of us. You know, regardless of we're people, analytics professional or just you know, we need to be aware. And your feelings, like all of ours, matter. You know, so yeah, just, you know, how do you think this data can or should be used? I, I think it, it can be used just because, um, uh, I guess, energy levels within a workforce, um, and, and I'm a, a big advocate for those that are active, tend to bring more energy. Um, so there'd be some data that you could gain from um, that, that sort of um, activity levels and um, the uh, what did you call it? I call them BMI, but what did you call it? Biometric yep. measurements. I think there could be some things like that um, that you could also help uh, the health status of your workforce by having that data available. Um, it all comes back to what Heather was talking about, though, whether it's being a bit creepy. Um, but I, I think there would be some use to that. And even if it was a voluntary um, offering of, of that data, I know at our workplace last year, we did a corporate challenge where steps um, and activities, so if you did work out at the gym, all this data was put into the team um, uh, data set and the, the winners were the ones that travelled the most distance um, across three months or something. So there was a big prize at the end, but they were prepared to put their data into that for a competition. So there might be some people willing to to put their um, their data in just just to see um, you know whether it could help with the health status. Who else has a similar initiative in their organisation, like a wellness challenge or something like that? You do as well. Yeah. Yeah. Is it around steps and wearing devices? Yeah. Often you can auto devices. Yeah, we ran a similar, yeah. Purchase fast just for coffee shops or lunches or, yeah, any stupid cash or activities like that. Interesting. Is, uh, for those of you in people analytics roles, are you accessing that data? You're not? Because uh, again, it goes back to you know, should we be asking that data? If so, for what purpose? You know, what Heather was contending to before, even though it's out there, you know, sh should we be grabbing it? Because there's a great story that can emerge in there, but is it worth telling? What's the action at the end of the day, and who would ultimately make that decision? I'll just highlight uh, Ernest Ning, uh, who leads uh, people analytics at Salesforce, has a very strong narrative about what they do around trust. If they're going to do an initiative, it cannot compromise or erode trust in the organization. It's a non-starter, and it goes up high chain in that organization to determine whether or not it's worthwhile doing. So when it goes out, there's a high degree of confidence that it's going to either maintain or enhance trust, not you know, do the opposite. So we have a lot that we could do, but you know, is it worth doing? So going back to this notion of uh, sports analytics and versus what we're doing in business analytics, because if, if I want on your behalf for you all to take away anything uh, from this discussion is that there are some very important distinctions that we have to be mindful of when we hear this narrative in, in the open marketplace, because teams, we talked about sports being in these discrete closed systems. Also, teams now are in a sports team, basketball team. You know, you have what, 12 players, five on the court each time. So how they, you know, there's the plus minus, you know, that you're, you're all familiar with plus minus, yeah. And there's also this case in organizations where, think about yourself, how many teams are you a part of? 
is your team discrete? Is it static? Does it move over time? So there's a movement towards team analytics right now. How, but you know, are teams really closed systems? Are, are, are they discrete? So anyway, going back to your scorecard, what were some of the data points, the analytics that resonated with you and the coaches that, that you looked at? Uh, well, I always liked the hustle play. So as a um, as a style of play, I was a defensive specialist, which is I was probably the last of the dying breed. You don't generally see de defensive specialists anymore. So all the hustle plays, the diving on loose balls, the steals or interceptions or deflections, mm -hmm. um, they were the stats that were considered our effort stats. Mm -hmm. um, and coaches did love that because it meant that your play was were actually they were driven. They were they were really trying um, to win, um, and. I, I liked those stats because they were the ones I tended to feature more on. <laughs> That's no, we have yet to play, and now my, my, my propensity to play has gone down significantly. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm um, very competitive. If it's just one-on-one, -on -one, I'm, I'm there to win. <laughs> this is not the discussion I would hope to have. I'm just going to politely ignore. Um, so questions from the audience. I don't want to make this exclusive uh, about... Um, George, did you have a question, or you just you're, you're just stretching, <laughs> or are you um, elevating your hand to to, to take on Emily? <laughs> um, can we do this? Can someone, Alex? Can you help me? Uh, can you run a uh, this mic back to the gentleman back in the corner? Thank you. Uh, we're going to wait for that question. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, Alan, you comment on the difference between sports teams and organizations. If you expand the sport team to be more than just the 12 basketball players, so sorry, my ignorance, maybe they're more, maybe they're fewer. <laughs> um, if you look at the physiotherapists, the everyone else around the team, doesn't that then start to look a little bit more like an organization? And if you looked at the scorecard for everyone involved in allowing you to be so successful, doesn't that look more like a real organization? What do you think? I mean, yes, there's a short answer, but yes. Well, it could possibly lead into the personal story I had to say. So, uh, do I? Please. So, um, when I was um, left the junior level and I was very keen, I had some success in the juniors and I was keen to, to make my way into the Opals um, or the national team squad, I was struggling to get in there and, and it was a decision that was made by a friend of mine that he was going to be really scientific. Um, he was a sports scientist. He was going to be really scientific about my training to get my fitness and strength right up to be like, so that I couldn't be left behind. Um, and, and his efforts, so when you talk about the additional people within a team, his efforts helped to increase my fitness um, and strength and he enabled me to get into the Opal squad um, and likely helped the performance of my team because I was fitter, stronger, able to last longer uh, in games. So, that, yeah, there are more people outside of the the 12 players, you've got the coaches as well um, and even uh, front office, so those people that bring crowds that also helps motivate the players on the court too. So um, the team is um, judged on performance based on stats and scoreboards and things like that. But um, in terms of the, the success of a program or a club, there's a lot more people in, involved in that. Yeah, yeah I, I like uh, your, your point because in the States, and I don't know what it's called here in Australia, but the general manager is the one who runs the organization. And what's their job? It's talent. It's making sure that they have the right talent at that time to go win a championship. And what's inherent in that talent is that they play roles, that there's diversity. And it's an art form because you're trying to hit it at a certain point in time, right? It can't just be all the same type of people, particularly in basketball, right? Because you have different roles. No, so your point's really well taken. Grant? Um, thanks, Al. It's a, it's a really interesting question. This. Um, you know, what's the difference between high performance in sport and high performance in organizations? And I hadn't thought about it in this way before, but there's kind of a social contract, I suspect, when you go into sports, particularly the elite level of sports, where we're going to look at every single stat that we can find on you and on the team and on performance, and we're going to put it in front of you every single day, and you're signing up to that. In fact, you kind of want it because that's how you improve, right, to your personal story. That social contract doesn't exist, broadly speaking, in organizations. And this whole question of how to use data, you know, we're heading towards there, right? And what's the new social contract that needs to be struck and can it be struck uh, for us to ever get at that level? Hmm. It's, a, it's, it's a great point. You have a comment on that? Oh, no, I, I was going to say the same. The, the true, at the elite level, 
um, when it's not just social basketball, which is still fun. But at the elite level, everyone's buying in. You, you trust that your teammates are doing everything they can ha and have done everything they can to prepare for each and every game. Um, and that they leave it all on the court. That's, that's the saying um, in sport. You just don't leave anything in the tank when you finish. Um, it, yeah, it's a, it, to translate that into the workplace, I think it would be really tough. But ideally, that's probably what, what everyone's trying to, trying to find when you talk about engagement and motivation and how do we get um, workers to feel that way about where they're working and what they're doing. And that's what the analytics will hopefully help. So. It's, um it's a great call out, Grant, it, and because you look at, uh, as an athlete myself, it, and having been through the evaluation process, which is very intrusive, Can you, would you agree with that? It's very kind of all lights are, are, are shining on you and you're being evaluated, how you walk, how you, you, you do things. Uh, then you look at the outstanding players, contributors, and many of them don't fit the bill. Like LeBron James in basketball, he was identified at a very early age to be the guy. Uh, Steph Curry, if you know basketball, is my height. And you know, for years, he's been no way, too small, too small, too small, too small. Yet, so I think there's some danger in overemphasizing, you know, the analytics and you know, going, okay, we have, you know, ten people who look like this, therefore, you know, people who look like this are going to be, you know, great contributors. You know, it, it leaves out the art form. It leaves out. It underappreciates diversity. I would contend. So we, I think, we have to be mindful of the downside and the dangers of analytics, as well as the ability to reduce risk by understanding these large data sets. Any comments on that? Yes. That corner of the room has a lot of energy right now. I'm going to have a face over here. Yeah, please. Yeah, just one comment on that. I'm, I'm actually involved with a, a sports analytics comment in our company, and I think it feeds into both, both Emily and the point there behind. Uh, so an example of how we would use data for a balance between wellness and preparation is before every training session, uh, all of our athletes would have an app that they would have on a one to five scale where they measure how they slept, how they're feeling, mm. what their food was like. And then they go through a five stage physiotherapy assessment where it's kind of just testing their muscle exertion. And that goes into a scoring system that decides on whether they're able to play or not. But to, to the point, I think there's a lot you can learn from that and bring into an organization. But because they're professional athletes and where I can move into the somewhat maybe intrusive, creepy side of things is there's another company that are, that are doing a lot of work with uh, professional teams in the UK, which is at the side of the pitch, uh, blood, blood cell testing. So before every training session, you would take a sample of the player's blood, just a prick of the finger. And then after the fitness training, you would retest that blood. And it's, it, each, each test only lasts for about a minute, but you would test elastic lactic acids. And based on the thousands and thousands of rows of data, you would decide uh, the likelihood of I injury and you would decide how much more that player can do. So, so it's really moving to that kind of next level and I think that's just an interesting kind of um, story in terms of where sport can go maybe too far at times. So before you, you answer, so what I'm hearing is that you suggest that we should prick people's finger and take their blood <laughs> as they come to work. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Uh, well, that, that story that you, or that what you're talking about there was the story that I was coming on um, originally in my head. That's what I was going to talk about. That, that coach, that si sports scientist that helped me achieve that improved fitness and strength was very scientific. And the first thing he said to me is, before we even start this, you need to keep a diet and I'm talking about late 90s, you know, there's no technology that was going to help me with this. Before I woke up of a morning, I had to take my resting heart rate. I had to talk about um, uh, the, the type of training that I did, how much, the level of intensity. I had to um, give a value out of 10 as to how I saw my nutrition, how I saw my sleep out of 10, the quality of it, um, and then how I felt at training or um, in general, so a general well-being score. And for him, the two critical ones were the resting heart rate and the general well-being to determine whether he was potentially overtraining me. But after eight months of keeping this diary with all these, you know, data um, entry data points, I realised that. Um, I had a trend that when I felt really great on the court and was performing really well, there were lighter training days in the two days leading up to it. And, but that wasn't why he asked me to keep 
or I didn't know that's why he was asking me to keep all those data points. I thought it was just the heart rate and the wellness, um, well-being factor that he was worried about. But after keeping that for so long, I was able to identify something that gave me an insight to me so that I could properly prepare for games. When I knew it was going to be a big game, I could say, OK, well, you know, the best preparation is that I take it light the, le the, the two days leading into that game. So it was really an amazing um, outcome. But it sounds like there's a, a systematic sort of um, program going on to, to gather that data now. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It's probably nearly the exact same system, but it's, it's just kind of leveraging technology now to, to have that store and then feed out the information almost automatically because it's, it's all within the app. But, but I'd say very similar concept and very interesting. I'm well, pleased to hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd just like to then put this out and a couple more things as we start to wrap up here is, uh, you know, whose data is it anyway as we move forward? Uh, you know, is it our role as employers to offer platforms that they can access, they meaning employees or workers, to better understand themselves, their energy levels, what they can do to be more present and perform or contribute in more meaningful ways? Or are we trying to just you know, grab data? Like uh, if you have a core HR system and you have talent cards or talent profiles, what's the average completion rate of your talent cards? Anybody? You probably don't want to say because it's probably not a high number. But there was um, with SAP, um, it was uh, success factors. It was something like 20% were filled out and even less was uh, current. Why is that? Because the value is not going back to the employee. So if we are curating technologies that are going to provide benefit to the individual and they own that data, they own the process, will there be a heightened propensity to drive towards our goals you know, of more contribution. I do not know. I think we have, again, and I'll, I use the word crisis liberally, I believe we have a crisis of creativity, a crisis of clarity in terms of what we want to achieve, and in some cases a crisis of courage to actually bring it to life. So I challenge you all, open your mind to you know, what's possible. In my view, I would hope that we become more of a curator of these platforms and offer them up as options because it can get very intrusive when we're taking that data as organizations and, okay, it goes into the black box. What's happening in the black box? And is that going to build trust or erode trust? Yeah, uh, you know, I'll leave that to your question. The final thing that I want to talk about, and Emily, I'm going to toss this over to you. As you may or may not know, there are genetic markers of us as human beings to indicate whether or not we're predisposed to uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome or PTSD or just, um, it's called something else now. Uh, somebody help me. Post-traumatic stress, post, what's that? Let's go with PTSD. So should we be testing for those genetic markers? We have the ability to do that. Should we, if they're going to, if they, an individual is going to go into a first responder role or a special forces role, should we be testing for that? I'm just going to leave that for you to, 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 to think about. But, but here's where we're, we're getting. There are people who um, are introverts and extroverts. You know, they show up in different ways. They're going to appreciate that, that diversity. There are people, uh, and Steven Pinker, a psychologist out of Harvard, has done a lot of work around Western society's ignorance of human nature. We have certain ways of being. Are we going to honor and celebrate those, or are we going to keep looking for that you know, perfect you know, fit? I believe, historically, we've been trying to go for this kind of perfect fit fit in this box, as opposed to being open-minded about the array of ways that box can be filled. So this is where I wanted to toss it over to you, Emily, as we wrap up, is that you, know, you as an athlete have played with a bunch of different you know, people. And some probably have been good friends that you work really well with, and some maybe less so. But you still functioned well together as a, a teammate. Has, has that been your e experience? And what can you say about that? Oh, without a doubt, some of my lifelong friends uh, are, are basketballs that I've played with and against. Um, and some were just teammates at the time. But the truth is that um, it's a bit 
you're, you've got the same common goal. It doesn't matter that you don't, you're not friends off the court. Once we were on the court, we were all trying to achieve the same thing and we held each other to the, to the same account. So um, friendships, it's always nicer playing with your friends. Um, uh, but it, in truth, I don't, I didn't experience any difference in terms of commitment to team and ke to team goals, whether I was really close with all my teammates or not. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And because again, as we wrap up, just the one thing I want to call out is that if you're mission driven, if you have the appreciation of diversity and you understand that, hey, we're all here to try and help one another, then the dynamic for success and achieving the goal is, is heightened. I, again, I think too often we have, okay, everyone like each other, let's all be engaged and hold hands and, and kumbaya, when in fact, you know, that given the nature of speed of life, you know, that often doesn't happen. So just being conscious of that goal. Well, on that point, sometimes, whether you're friends or not, we're all competitors, so practice was where it was really yeah. <laughs> a challenge. Um, game time, we were all on the same team, but it was it was interesting time sometimes at practice. But um, you're, you're not we just selling made, our no, one on one very. I'm uh, just very saying. Well. I'm just saying we we still helped each other get better because we knew that's what we were there to do. So, but yeah, it was it was interesting. Uh, I, I miss it. <laughs> outstanding. Any closing comments? No, just uh, thanks for listening, and um, it's a p pity that Adrian wasn't here, but um, his loss. <laughs> Well, and just so everyone knows, you know the weather is really bad, so I imagine that, that was a factor because I know he ran out uh, for a bit. But Emily, thank you very, very much. Super appreciate you. And uh, here we go. Thank you.